maybe we can start with a question that I, I put to Ruth Marcus a few minutes ago, which is, I think, um, from a practical standpoint and an ideological, philosophical standpoint, one of the hardest things uh, people in the press are, are facing today, which is how do you how do, how do you convince people who are predisposed because of ideology, resentment, philosophy, religion, tribe, region, whatever it is, uh, predisposed not to believe things you in the press know to be true because you've studied it empirically? Um, you're on the road a lot um, talking to many, many Trump voters. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about your experience in trying to convey um, the idea that the MSM is not the enemy of the people, to borrow a phrase. Mm -hmm. Well, I begin everything by trying to reassure them that I'm not a hologram orchestrated by the Clintons. Right. Um, that's not true. I don't do that. Uh, the, the first thing I would say, just in response to your question, is I'm not an advocate. I'm a journalist, right? So my, you know, it's not that I'm trying to convince people of the righteousness. No, but you're an advocate for the idea that the pre truth. that the press stands for the truth, flawed, whatever, but stands for the truth. So, and it is remarkable, you go to Trump events, you go to Trump rallies, and the resistance to common shared, what we think of as commonly shared facts is fairly profound on everything from family separation policies to airstrikes in Syria. I mean, there are a number of things where there literally exists an, al an alternate reality where none of the things we know to be true are true. So in my questioning of, I mean, I think one of the things that you can't do when you're interfacing with Trump supporters or people who don't share these facts or a belief in these facts is not to put them on the defensive. I mean, my tact usually is to understand what they think to be true and then to sort of question them repeatedly about how, it, for example, on family separation, someone said that was an Obama era policy. And I sort of like tried to dig into where, what exactly they thought Obama had done to, to dictate this policy or how, how it was a vestige of the Obama administration. And if you ask people enough times, you eventually get to the kernel of the thing they think is true. And that is where it's easier to sort of debunk what is false? I mean, usually in all this theory making on, you know, on the dark side of the internet or at Fox News, there's some sort of like thing that a kernel of, of veracity around which an elaborate sort of fake theory has been built. Well, what part of, uh, of the critique of the mainstream media emanating from Trump supporters from the right, what part do you actually agree with, if anything. Do you, do you see some, some reason, some justifiable reason for people to have this resentment and mistrust, and so on? I think yesterday is a great case in point. There is a feeling on the part of Trump supporters and a lot of conservatives that the mainstream media does not cover legitimate wins. The renegotiating of, of NAFTA is a legitimate win for this White House. It has been completely overshadowed by the Kavanaugh confirmation. That's a function of like the way media works and profits and ratings. But it also, I think, feeds this narrative that, look, even when he does something that's actually good and it is an accomplishment, it gets no coverage. And I do think, because most media is generated and is taped and is broadcast out of coastal cities like New York and DC, there is a lack of an understanding about what actually matters to people in the middle of the country and how they think about the world. I think we've tried to correct for that since 2016 because so much of us missed the story. But that, I mean, at the end of the day, if you don't live in Ohio, if you don't live in Missouri, if you don't live in Nevada, you're not going to understand the crosswinds in the same way. And, and that is not necessarily bias. That's a, that's a matter of fact. But if you overlay that with the stories we do cover and the importance we give them, I think it, it does give us you know, a sense of injustice in terms of whether we are fair in our coverage. Right. Jeff, talk about the history a little bit of the partisan press. Um, we feel as if we're in a hyper-partisan moment in American history, but the truth of the matter is, um, for much of American history, the press has been uh, almost entirely partisan uh, and divided, echo, echo chambers and filter bubbles and all the rest in the, in the, in the pre-digital era. Um, talk about that and, and, and tell us if you see some cause for hope that we're, we're maybe in a trough right now, but you, we go in and out of these things rather than being in a kind of terminal decline toward uh, two camps that just do not accept common, uh, any set of common facts. The press of 1800 makes art 
current one seem mild. The insults that people hurled at each other, um, Thomas Jefferson and John Marshall calling each other the great llama of the mountain, and uh, it's not clear what that means to be a llama. The great it's, llama it's, of it's the mountain. Like isn't, that, isn't that shocking? No, it's the worst thing to be a llama. It's appalling. Um, and, uh, I mean, and, and, it's and an Marshall twistifications crowd, and so forth. I'm going to try um, that on Lindsey Graham tomorrow, see if it works. Yeah. <laughs> Well, You're well, the great llama of the mountain. More to the, more, more, it had something to do with being in Monticello and looking down at everyone. Oh, yeah. oh, like liberals in the ivory tower, or that, just exactly, the ivory tower. Exactly. The it. llama mountain. And 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 the uh, and and the um, but the duel of the Burr and Hamilton was inflamed by stuff that was in the newspapers. And at the Constitution Center, we have the originals of the letters and so forth, and much of this ended up in the press. And the National Gazette, where Madison wrote his essays defending the Constitution, and remember the Federalist Papers originally appear in the newspapers, is a virulent anti-Federalist uh, organ. At the same time, these things had limited reach and they were distributed slowly. So Madison, in his essays on national government in 1791, written in this partisan National Gazette, expresses the hope that at some point, uh, an enlightened class of journalists that he calls the literati, Basically, it's the staff of the Atlantic, you know, of all the <laughs> that the, the literati will slowly disperse reason across the land, and the people will take the time to read complicated arguments. And this will obviate the dangers of the extended republic. The bad thing about having a really big country is that people can't discover facts. The good thing is that passion, that mobs can't formalize. He thinks because the press, is a, it's a mass circulation newspaper, but it travels slowly. All the partisan stuff will be mixed with these long, complicated arguments which people will take the time to read, and reason will prevail. The problem now is the speed of deliberation. I mean, we, we, this is a partisan, we've been partisan before, the press has been partisan before, but we didn't have Twitter. Yeah. And, we, and, and the other obvious difference is, now everyone is a journalist. And in many ways, that's a wonderful, empowering thing that everyone can express their opinions in real time, but it also allows for the f f uh, quick formation of mobs in a way that has undermined the institutional media and makes things It's a question for both of you, and it's a simple one. Can our form of democracy survive Twitter? And everything it stands for? You know, it's a serious... You go first, because I want to well, think about it. <laughs> I, think, I think when we look back on the Trump presidency, assuming he is one day no longer president, um, I think, I think, I think that, that we will talk about a lot of things, but he did, inv I mean, one of the longest lasting pieces of his legacy may be the fact that he revolutionized the way presidents communicated with the American people. And I mean, his Twitter habits have changed our democracy. They've changed journalism in terms of what we cover. I mean, they've, they've re shifted the scale in terms of what's important. Trump's tweets can knock the most important sort of policy news or foreign news out of the ballpark immediately on any station around the and country. And he knows it. He, and he knows he's, it. He's strategic. And, and, and journalists are constantly forced into the position of defending why it's worth covering a tweet. And our, our, our position is usually, well, this is the president of the United States, effectively. It's a presidential statement. It's a presidential statement. All right, that did not, I mean, Obama tweeted, but it was not with the same, he was not as promiscuous, he was not, I mean, he was not as. Obama um, tweeted about national parks he was visiting. Yeah, it was a exactly. Different, a it was different. very strategic. Trump, it's like his, I mean, it is the, the closest thing we have to inside his brain, and therefore it is like very, it's, well, but it is. I mean, I think it is very much There's no filter, yeah. There isn't. And, and that, I think the expectation it will be interesting to see if the next president, uh, whoever he or she may be, what he or she does with that medium. Because right. I feel like as, as complicating and difficult as it, is, as it is for us to all navigate, it's an incredibly useful tool as well. But Twitter is the opposite of a cooling mechanism. It's the, right? it's, yeah. the, it's the heating mechanism. So can we survive it? The most alarming Twitter study recently, a couple weeks ago, the Times published a survey showing that people who are exposed to the opposite point of view on Twitter become more polarized, not less. In other words, they dig in their heels, and it has to do with uh, the way that uh, people define themselves tribally. So the hope that by listening civilly to different points of view, people could collaborate is not true when the tweets are short and fast. 
Um, in these kind of settings, when you bring together people of different perspectives, people can change their minds. And the coolest thing the Constitution Center does, the anti-Twitter, is this weekly podcast where I get to call up the leading liberal and conservative scholar of the week to debate the constitutional issues of the week. And I, th we had the thrilling experience of having two scholars on treason, the liberal and conservative scholar, because the, the definition of treason is really wonky. You need a, giving aid and comfort to enemies, two witnesses, or confession in open court. Once the two sides debated it, the conservative decided there was a stronger case for treason against the president, if the facts were proven, than uh, he had thought before hearing the arguments on the other side. So that suggests that when you take the time to disaggregate and time, it, the, the central question is time, and I want to plug Greg Wiener's amazing book, Madison's Metronome, uh, which notes the centrality of time in the framers' uh, vision of deliberation. You have to slow things down so that people can take the but time. But this is quixotic. I mean, this is, this is really quixotic what you're talking about. You're talking about a podcast with constitutional scholars. Uh, podcast is available on parchment. <laughs> Really that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. You could it could be mailed to you, right? <laughs> you but but I mean, you know, I, you compare that to the, the demagogues of the left and right and their instant ability to communicate to millions of people. There's no. It's not a fair fight, Jeff. Well, that's where the institutions come in, and that's why you must have strong institutions of Congress to check the presidency and the Supreme Court to check the Senate and the uh, House and the, and the, and the president and, and, and the executive. And if the institutions are doomed by Twitter, and we were just talking before about the ways that Twitter has undermined deliberations in Congress, the Supreme Court doesn't tweet, but, and, and the case for cameras in the courtroom is different because you'd have, Justice Scalia, you, you, the late Justice Scalia said, if you could have federal marshals in every house forcing people to watch the entire argument from mm -hmm. beginning to end, he'd support it. But he fears that little snippets of the arguments would be taken out of context. And now with Twitter, that fear becomes more real, that you could actually reduce the arguments to a contextual snippet. So the institutions are crucial, and I think that's the only thing they can say about it. I guess to that point, though, I do worry that the institutions have realized the only way that they remain relevant and the people in those institutions retain their jobs is by inflaming passion. I mean, right? The, look, at, look, look at Lindsey Graham sitting on the Senate Judiciary Committee for a Supreme Court nomination issues this sort of like dramatic monologue, the likes of which, I mean, he's not the kind of person that typically does that. It'll be interesting to see what you have to say with, to him tomorrow. but. You know, I think a lot of people believe, whether or not this is fair, that Donald Trump won 2016 because Hillary Clinton couldn't connect with voters. She didn't have the same emotional relationship. And so when you have institutions, whether the presidency or the Senate, or to some degree the House, where success is predicated on making an emotional connection with the public and the electorate, why get rid of social media if it helps right. foster so, that connection? So the, the looming question is, is our ability to snap back to previous norms. Correct. I mean, yeah. after the Trump presidency, do you do we just revert to form, or, or or is the genie just out of the bottle? As a member of the media, you know, we talk about there is like this sort of dirty um, acknowledgement that Trump has been very good for the media because people are reading more, people are discussing more, people are tuning in more. It's hard to imagine the media saying at the end of this, and I think the voters have been inoculated to this as well. Oh. Like, let's, let's just take a break. Isn't it good to have everything reset to zero? I mean, everybody wants a break to some degree. But I don't know that you're going to have, like, the si if, if politics goes back to the status quo pre-Trump, I don't know that anybody is going to be particularly actually relieved. I mean, I do think people, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I do no, no, feel no. like there's an incredible appetite. I mean, it won't always be able to operate at this level of frenzy. But right. I don't know. People like the circus. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, yes. Like I said, the stakes feel incredibly high. People are incredibly invested. And that's legit. That has nothing to do with this other thing that I'm talking about, which is like the game of it all. But Jeff, isn't there a reason to, to hope in, in, in some way, uh, and I'm putting my thumb on the scale of what I'd like to see return to, but um, that, that every presidency is a reaction to a previous presidency. You elect a certain kind of person, and you elect somebody who's very, very different. Uh, I, I mean, what are the chances that, I mean, looking back in history, what are the chances that the next president is the most boring person ever <laughs> to achieve high, the highest office? I mean, the contingency of history is so striking, and, uh, you know, Buchanan followed by Lincoln or uh, the catastrophe of Johnson picked by accident and, and so forth. So anything's possible. 
the scary possibility which we're talking about now is are these changes structural? If Madison was right and it's uh, direct democracy leads inevitably to demagogues, then the next president is as likely to be a celebrity liberal right. as a well, celebrity conservative. Because I don't think Donald Trump is president because Barack Obama was boring. Right. I think that in terms of policy and other things, there's, you know, the, the, the sort of back and forth. Reaction of America. to. But, but the, the, this other thing of the Trump presidency, which is frenzy, you know, passions inflamed, like that's that's just a separate thing entirely. I think that that exists as an inflection point in history, less than a natural sort of um, sign curve in terms of emotion. We're going to do questions in a minute, but what, why do you two think that there has been quite obviously insufficient sanction for a president who, when a lie, an untruth, a, a misleading statement is pointed out, doesn't correct, but doubles down. I mean, that, that's one of the innovations of this presidency, I would say. No, 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 I mean, this, this, this is just observable truth. I mean, that, that, that ordinary, all politicians lie. When you catch them on a lie, when we in the media catch them on a lie, they trim, they, they, they walk things back, they sometimes apologize. Here we have a system in which there's no quarter is given. And, and obviously, um, he's rewarded uh, for this or, or insufficiently sanctioned. So where, where did the, it's not where the institutions fail, where did the norms fail? Were the norms insufficiently strong? I, first of all, I, I do think it's partly institutional. I mean, I think that there is an entire wing of conservative media that doesn't ask him to fact check and his, or, or correct himself, and his supporters watch and digest that news media, so they don't believe he needs to. So as long as the, the base record. is fine. As long as the, I mean, he's made a calculation. It doesn't matter what the mainstream fake news liberal voters think. It only it only matters what my people think and what the media they watch believes I should do. I mean, I, I do think if Fox News was issuing corrections about the thousands of lies this president has said publicly, that would be an issue for this White House, but they don't. I think Alex has said something very important about the transformation of politics into emotion, and once the personal becomes political, people react to facts through their unconscious biases, or to use the fa fa fancy word, the availability heuristics, people tend to believe the tribe or person who they personally identify with. And as early as Jefferson, the founders understood the malleability of the difference between facts and opinions, but it becomes more important to support your camp than to consider uh, facts on the other side, and that is uh, a real problem for democracy. Like, can I just use one example of that? Like the Kavanaugh, I, I keep going back to the Kavanaugh confirmation because I think it crystallizes so much of the dynamics in play. There is now a real question about whether a Supreme Court nominee perjured himself in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and that is being met with calls that the left is somehow moving the goalposts, which is a direct admission that somehow the truth is actually just a set of goalposts that can be moved here and there across the field. Um, I want to go to some question. Oh, you have something here? Please. Hi, I'm Jean Golden. Uh, you talked about the current atmosphere uh, being that of like a circus. And I can only agree with it, not because it's exciting, but I'm thinking of the uh, circus act where someone's on a high wire without a safety net because I'm anxious all the time and I'm worried uh, that our safety net meeting, as you pointed out, the Congress not working as well or other parts of the government not, not working as well with checks and balances, just not uh, functioning uh, as a, a safety net for us. Thank you. Is there a net, Jeff? The net is the Constitution. The net is the Constitution. And the question is, will the Constitution save us if the courts are delegitimized? And it's impossible to understate the significance of the role that John Roberts is going to be playing in this new world. Because if we have a Supreme Court that is routinely overturning decisions by five to four votes, regardless of whether Judge Kavanaugh is confirmed or not, the court will appear to be illegitimate in the eyes of 
at least half the country. He's concerned about this. The justices are concerned about it. Justice Kagan just last week said the whole court's legitimacy depends on popular acceptance. And once that's gone, then the rule of law is under siege. So Jeff, it's a you're, very serious You're a question. Supreme Court expert. Let me ask you this directly. Did Brett Kavanaugh disqualify himself for the Supreme Court because he launched what I think everyone would agree, regardless of side, a fairly ferocious attack on liberals, the left, the Clintons, and so on, and the press? As head of the nonpartisan National Constitution Center, <laughs> I can very strongly describe the arguments on both sides. There are arguments on both sides. The argument uh, in favor of his disqualifying himself are that after that uh, screed, he could never be accepted as nonpartisan in any uh, case which involved the people that he denounced, and he will be asked to accuse himself, and uh, uh, that uh, he will also be so angry that it's impossible to him to, for, to view things fairly, and for that reason, even if he's innocent of the charges, that uh, he cannot function effectively as a judge. The argument on the other side is that uh, Justice Thomas did go through similar allegations and made a similarly angry response. After he was confirmed to the court, he said, I would have stayed only for 20 years, but now the liberals have pissed me off so much that I'm going to stay forever. And uh, nevertheless, he's proved to be a, a judge respected and even much liked by his fellow justices, whose opinions have been distinctive, uh, interesting, great to teach as a law professor, and have a strong uh, amount to say for them as an example of constitutional originalism. And therefore, his supporters would say that his anger has not influenced his jurisprudence. Those are the arguments on both sides. Return to the idea, sorry, Dan DeLury, want to return to the idea uh, stated earlier that uh, everything that a president, whether it's this president or any other president, says is therefore significant and important and must be covered. Um, news editors every day make decisions on what news should be featured and printed uh, as opposed to other news. And so why is it that whatever the president says, let's take tweets as an example, is significant that it has to be covered? And, and in fairness, Trump tweets a lot. Not every tweet is covered. I think that there is some bar that it needs to clear. But you have to understand, people are fascinated by this president. They're enraged by him. They're abhorred by him. They adore him. But the f people feel very strongly about this president. So there's a very basic calculation that is made. And this is unfortunately a reality of our news media about viewership and audience. They want to know, the right? I mean, there is a circular. It is a snake eating its tail, right? Perhaps if they weren't fed so many Trump tweets, maybe they wouldn't care as much. But again, I mean, there is the, the we go back to the basic calculation. The, let's say it's an inflammatory tweet from the President of the United States talking about a policy that matters or a, a, a Supreme Court justice. Whatever it is, I mean, there is a feeling that that deserves to be covered, however, in whatever depth. You know, in the two previous presidents I covered, they, they, they move around with stenographers. Um, and the stenographers capture every word spoken by the President because it's the President of the United States. Um, you could argue, as Alex does, that the tweets are actually more important because these are a direct window into what he's actually thinking in real time. This is the most powerful person in the world. This is the man who commands a nuclear arsenal that can destroy the entire world. Um, we, 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 these are presidential statements. Um, the, these, are, um, these are direct, these give us direct insight into how he's thinking, what he's thinking, what he's doing, and I don't see any way around them. If these tweets were delivered serially and orally in a press conference, we would, of course, carry them live. So I can't imagine why we wouldn't, uh, why we wouldn't focus on them and try to interpret them and understand what this means for his presidency and what it means for America. Just a quick point to support the question. Brandeis, in his privacy essay, says, once gossip attains the dignity of print, it crowds out the space in the public mind available for discussions of matters of public concern. And that's what's going on. Now, you may be right as an editor, you can't ignore it. But unless the, the gatekeepers do ignore it, then we're reduced to seeing politics as personal. I believe we have time for one more short question. Am I correct? Oh, there's somebody with a mic back here. Sorry, yes. Hi, my name is Sergio Marsuach. I am from San Juan, Puerto Rico. I'm glad to be here. My question goes back to your 
prior statement uh, about the change that Twitter and technology has had on politics. But if you look at American history, many presidents have tried to go above and beyond or around the media to reach the people. TR had the baldy pulpit, FDR the fireside chats, JFK, LBJ, Reagan had TV. So really, isn't the question more about the character of the person in the office than technology? Well, I think the, like all of those sort of parallel mechanisms to communicate with the American public were considered. I mean, Obama went around the media all the time, and I can tell you someone covered the White House. We didn't love it, but that, the, that was a concerted effort to get their message communicated, and it was an orchestrated effort. The difference now is the tweets that are issuing forth from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, I mean, some of them are sent at 4 o'clock in the morning. They're, they're misspellings. They feel off the cuff, completely immediate. They're really emotionally charged. They are not part of sort of considered dialogue with the American public, and that feels really new, and is, to your point, perhaps a reflection of the personal itself, right, of the, of the politician itself. I don't know that there's any other politician or potential presidential nominee that would even think to, to issue the tweets that this president has. But nonetheless, it's changed the dynamic of, like, what is acceptable to issue forth to the American public. It's a central point, and you could blame it all on the election of 1912. <laughs> That was when, you know, it all comes back to uh, the progressive era and history, and when Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson ran against William Howard Taft, they insisted for the first time that the president was a steward of the people who should directly channel popular will, and Taft, the doomed constitutionalist, defending the old Madisonian vision that the president is accountable to the Constitution. Now, obviously, the technologies have changed. Twitter is quicker than the radio and the gramophone, uh, but also, but it's populism that is uh, different, the difference between JFK and FDR who are accountable to political parties and Roosevelt and Trump, Theodore Roosevelt and Trump, both who are insisting that they alone represent the people and they alone can save it. So the combination of populism plus the new technologies is an explosive combination. Jeff, Alex, thank you very, very much. And thank you all for being here.